Well, what's up, everyone? Welcome back to the That Church Podcast. My name is Kendall Harness. I am one of your hosts for this podcast. I co-host this podcast with my dad, sorry, Pastor Scott <laughs> uh, Harness, and we are the pastors, or two of the pastors at That Church in Central Arkansas. Uh, super excited to be with you. Today, we have a special, special episode. This is a walk into what is called Holy Week. Um, Holy Week is essentially the week of Jesus' crucifixion, uh, also his burial, and then ultimately his resurrection. This episode will most likely be divided into two parts. Uh, part one, we will cover pretty much everything up until the crucifixion, and then next week we'll cover from the crucifixion until the resurrection, and even some after the resurrection, yep. most likely. So uh, that's what we're doing. This podcast, we host it for two reasons. Number one is to share content from the weekend. Um, sometimes there's extra message material that we don't get the opportunity to share on Sunday just for time consumption constraints uh, that we like to share here, or uh, the secondary reason, or or and the secondary reason that we host this podcast is to promote biblical literacy. The Bible is the most interesting book, as you're going to see today. This is a very interesting piece of scripture. Uh, it's interesting, it's factual, and it's an incredible book. It's more interesting than Harry Potter and more factual than any history book we've ever had. So with that said, let's jump right in. I don't want to dilly-dally today. Um, we're going to jump straight <laughs> into this podcast and talk about Holy Week. So essentially kind of sum it up for me. Why is Holy Week important? Well, honestly, it's important because Jesus is the subject of it and it, and it really outlines what he was doing leading up to the cross. You and I studying this just before we got in here, one of the things that stood out to me, yeah, we got our, our energy drink. One of the things that stood out to me and stood out to you um, was that when we began to study this week and go through the actual events of what Jesus was doing, what was happening in his life this final week leading up to his his crucifixion, his burial, and ultimately resurrection. It's unbelievable how powerful it is just oh, yeah. to walk through that and go, okay, what was he doing on Sunday? Yeah. What was happening on Sunday? What was happening Monday? And that's what we're yeah. going to do. We're going to walk through every one of these. One of the things that would be a great, I, I really personally think it'd be a fantastic thing for a family to do is you could take this podcast um, and take these days as we outline them, and you could enjoy these starting next week. Yeah, you could enjoy these from Sunday, um, starting Sunday, all the way through Resurrection Sunday. Each night with your family. Yeah, with your family. Spend it would be a time. great thing to walk through, and and I just feel like that there are times when we're talking about Jesus and we're talking about who He is and what He's done. I think sometimes we treat him like a mythological character like we would Star Wars or something. Yep. And when you see what he was doing, where he was staying, what was happening that day, what was happening on Tuesday, what was happening Wednesday, Thursday, and, and you sense the pressure of of what Jesus is getting ready to do as far as the sacrifice, you, the pressure increases. Yeah. You can feel it increasing. And so that that's what this is about. <laughs> and like when like when I watch uh, like The Chosen, for instance, I love The Chosen TV show. I think it's fantastic. It's incredible. Uh, when I watch The Chosen, there it's funny how when you watch that show, you can feel the pressure like building. Yeah, like yeah. You're, you know where this is going. And that's so right. Holy Week is interesting to me because you look at it and you go, man, you, you've got a a kind of set of things that take place in Jesus' life that are all leading to the crucifixion. And you do feel kind of this, this stepping into this larger event, and there's a larger story going on that obviously the people around Jesus wouldn't have been privy to. They wouldn't have known, but Jesus would have known what was coming next and what That's was right. about to happen. It is interesting that every single gospel covers Holy Week. Um, I'm just going to spout these off really quick, and then we're going to jump into this a little bit deeper. But uh, Matthew chapter 21 through 28, uh, Mark chapter 11 through chapter 16, Luke chapter 19 through chapter 24, and John chapter 12 through 20, 21. <laughs> so every single gospel writer saw fit to cover Holy Week. So obviously we can assume that this is a pretty important piece Absolutely. of the story. So with that said, where do you want to start? Let's start with Palm Sunday. Let's start with okay. what we call the triumphant entry of Jesus. This begins Holy Week. Um, and, and this begins our timeline. Yeah. And and like you said, you, each one of the gospels include this, this final week. And so you know, Matthew 21, Mark 11, Luke 19, John 12 is where, where you're going to find this. And you could follow along. And this, again, this would be such a great study for a family. And we've done it before. We have, yeah. And um, it's it's super, super powerful. So so the triumphant entry into Jerusalem, 
that entry looks like, looks like this. Tell us about what, is, what does it look like when Jesus comes into Jerusalem. So I think what's interesting, and I think kind of the, one of the things that we have to lay out here is that, you know, the Bible is a spiritual book, but it's also a, a historical book. And there's, there's kind of one historical piece that I do want to point out before we jump all the way into the triumphant entry. You know, Jerusalem was a powder keg at this point. Um, you've got a community of people who have been literally programmed from birth to look for a delivering Messiah. That's yes. what they've been looking for. And in their minds at this point, and you're going to see later how as we get closer to the crucifixion, this is going to be become even more true. The people of Israel have firmed up in their minds that this Messiah, delivering Messiah, is going to be an earthly king, and that earthly king is going to free them from the physical oppression of the Roman Empire, because that's who they sit under right now. The Romans had had oppressed the people of Israel and their idea of a delivering Messiah is a warring king who's going to come in and deliver the people. Like a military, a bit, like military, a military leader. king. Yeah, yeah. he's going to come in and Political go, hey, leader. I'm going to shake off the shackles of the Roman emperor, Empire and mm. we're going to be a free state and restore the 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 throne of David and all those things. Um, mm. About 30 years before Jesus, so, uh, there was an uprising that was smashed by Pompey um, and those types of things. And so the people of, of Israel are pretty they're pretty upset with the Romans. They're not super happy about being under Roman oppression. Now that sets the stage for a Messiah to return. The people are hungry for someone to come in and free the people. Jesus has come in and he's done things no one else has been able to do. When you hear later when the high priests are conspiring against Jesus, they even reference that there had been other Messiahs mm -hmm. to arise. And essentially the, the wisdom that is kind of asserted amongst those high priests is that these other messiahs had flamed out. They had had a moment in the sun, and because they weren't legitimate, they essentially had just gone away, and sure. the, the, their movements had died. Although these movements had come, ultimately they would get exposed somehow, and that was it. So the wisdom that the, the high priests originally have before they later try to kill Jesus is that they're like, hey, if Jesus is not legitimate, then he'll flame out like these other guys did. Uh, Jesus doesn't, though. Jesus continues to perform miracles. He continues to be, every time he has an opportunity to be disproven, he turns it as another opportunity for him to be more confirmed as the Godship or as his, you know, the son of God. So the triumphant entry is when Jesus enters Jerusalem at the beginning of Holy Week. It's on that Sunday. There's an entrance into Jerusalem. Um, this is in Matthew chapter 21, verses 1 through 11. This fulfills a particular prophecy. It's in Zechariah chapter 9 and verse 9. It says this in Zechariah. It says, Rejoice, O people of Zion. Shout in triumph. What's triumph and entry? Shout in triumph. O people of Jerusalem, look, your king is coming to you. So this promised Messiah is coming. He is righteous and victorious, yet he is humble, riding on a donkey, riding on a donkey's colt. So Zechariah, hundreds of years before Jesus, makes a prophecy that essentially there would be a king to come and take over united Israel, and his coming would be announced that he is righteous and victorious. And on top of that, not only would he be righteous and victorious, he'd be humble. So he's not coming in riding on a horse. He's coming in riding on a donkey. Now, this is important because in Old Testament times, even the kings that came in riding on a horse, it was a show of aggression. So authority, they're authority. Coming, we're coming to take over. I'm coming and I'm very aggressive. Warring king. The Romans would have never come riding into Jerusalem on donkeys. They come in on horses. And the cult they're, of a donkey. Yeah, they're, the cult of a donkey is even yeah. worse, right? It's yeah. a, it's a a humble, like a humble thing. <laughs> it's a nice boulder. Anyway, but yeah, no, it's, it's one of those things where it's like, you know, Jesus rides in on a colt. This is, this is a show of humility. This is not Jesus exalting himself. This is him taking a role of humility and it's a show of peace. There's like, hey, I'm not coming here to, to, to create war or incite violence. I'm coming here to be a peaceful offering. And so this is an interesting piece. This is referenced in uh, Luke chapter 19, verse 30, where it talks about the donkey's colt had never been ridden. Um, so this donkey was set apart in Hebrew culture. Donkeys that had never been ridden were actually set apart as ceremonially clean um, because they'd never been ridden before. So that's what Jesus rides into Jerusalem on the triumphant entry. I think it's interesting, too, that when you think about it, at this particular time, this is the time of the Passover. Mm -hmm. And so when Jer Jesus is coming in through the city gates of Jerusalem, I think it's estimated around a quarter of a million Jews would make the pilgrimage. A lot of people to, there. They would make the pilgrimage to Jerusalem um, to make their sacrifices um, on, at Mount Moriah at the right. temple. Yep. And so, so as they're filtering into the gates of Jerusalem, you you have these families, and, and this comes from Exodus chapter 
uh, it's chapter 11, right. um, round verse four. Mm-hmm. So where, where God gives the children of Israel under Moses' leadership at the time of the Passover, he tells them that there's going to be this special meal that they're going to observe. And in that meal, there would be the sacrifice of this lamb. It had to be a perfect lamb. Yep, no mistakes, no and, mess-ups. And it had to be no without spot or blemish or injury or anything else, perfect lamb. That lamb would be sacrificed. The blood of that lamb would be put on the doorpost of the family's home, um, and they would eat that lamb in a special meal. Yep. That's the Passover feast. That's the Passover lamb. Now, when they would do that, that night when the death angel came, which was a picture of God's judgment on the sin of Egypt, that angel would see the blood, according to God, and he would pass over that that family. That, right. in, in other words, the judgment of the death requirement, the fee for sin, would not have to be paid by them because he would see the blood. The lamb would have fulfilled the, the obligation. It, sure. um, now, we do find out later that actually the lamb and its blood didn't fulfill the obligation. Not fully, right. But, well, because later God requires them to make a sacrifice for the mm. firstborn to make up for the one that he did not take that right. night. So, so in other words, one of the things that we need to keep in mind when we talk about the Old Testament sacrificial system where they're sacrificing these animals, the animals were a picture of the price. Um, they were not a picture of the payment. So sure, this was the, the sure. yeah, it was the price of sin, but it wasn't the payment. Jesus would be the payment. So put all this together. At this particular time, God told them to observe this feast every single year. So about a quarter of a million people are filtering in through the city gates of Jerusalem. Many of these families tethered with them would have had this little lamb that they have been raising and preparing, keeping safe, making yeah. sure that that lamb doesn't injure itself, doesn't get hurt, doesn't have skin, you know, a skin problem, doesn't have hair knocked off or anything. Yeah. There, so imagine this little family. Here's your little family. You're leading your lamb in. That lamb would have been taken to the temple and that lamb would have been sacrificed. It's been estimated. 50,000 to 100,000 lambs would be sacrificed during that time. And so here you are coming to the city gate. So you've got your family, you got this little lamb, you're walking in. But next to you, un- unbeknownst to you, hmm. you don't even realize it, is the one who John the Baptist said, behold the lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Yeah. And here he is on a colt, tethered, and he's being walked through the city gate. Yeah. He would. This would be the last time Jesus would enter the city gate of Jerusalem. This was, right. this was it. This is where he's going to come into this city um, and this would begin, well, it's not the last time, but it's, it's the, 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 the movement, uh, towards the last time he would live. In, yeah, in other words, it's very symbolic, very symbolic. And, I think and that, so, and yeah, so he, so he walks in through that city. These lambs are going to be slain around 150 to hundred thousand of them. Those lambs were a, a price for our sin, but the payment, the ultimate God's ultimate payment would be Jesus, and there he is among them, right. the Lamb of God. And so so Jesus would come. This would be the beginning of the the final days of his life that would lead up to his sacrifice for the sins of the world. It's such an incredible picture, a beautiful picture of what God was up to and what God was doing. Oh, for sure, for sure. Well, and you look at, you know, so this triumphant entry, you know, what what happens here is that Jesus begins to enter the city, and as he does, the, the, there's all these people already in the city, um, and many of these people recognize Jesus, at least to some degree, for, for who he truly is or what he truly is, and, and or at least in their minds what they thought he was, which was this king that was going to unseat, you know, the Roman authority and whatever else, and, and I do think this is interesting, this entry of Jesus into Jerusalem is foreshadowing. Um, so this time he rides on a donkey. Um, he's a sacrifice. He's humble. He's all those things. But Jesus will enter Jerusalem once again in Revelation chapter 19, 19. and he will not be riding a small colt. He will be riding a horse, and it's a very different entry. And I just want to read a quick excerpt from Exodus, or sorry, Revelation 19, 11 to 12. It says, Then I saw heaven open, opened, and a white horse was standing there. Its rider was named Faithful and True, for he judges fairly and wages a righteous war war specifically is what he says. Verse 12, he says, his eyes were like flaming or were like flames of fire and on his head were many crowns. A name was written on him that no one understood except himself. This is Jesus on a white horse that he is riding into. Painted on himself in blood. Yeah, painted on himself in blood. Yeah, Yeah, there's this, there's this name that no one understands except for him. And this is when he returns in all his righteousness and glory. Obviously, Jesus coming into the triumphant entry on Palm Sunday or on uh, the triumphant entry on that Sunday, he's obviously not in his full glory. He's just Jesus as a sacrifice well, for the people. Yeah. he's a facet of it. He, so yeah. you have the, Jesus is portrayed in, in two particular ways in scripture. He's portrayed as a lamb 
the sacrificial lamb, the lamb right. who was slain, but he's also pictured as a lion. Lion, yeah. So, so he's a lion and a lamb. That's right. And so you're seeing the other facet of who he is. When Jesus first came um, through through the city gates of Jerusalem, when he first came, he came as a humble servant, a sacrificial right. servant to to be sacrificed for the sins of the world. But when he returns, um, he's not coming back as a sacrificial lamb. You, you're not. You you won't see a weeping savior dying on a cross, giving his life. That's already happened. Right. What he comes back next is a warring king to take control and take over that which is rightfully his. And so, right. so that is a, a, an incredible picture. This is also known as Palm Sunday. Palm Sunday. Because you have during so those this, two things are the same. Triumphant yeah. entry and Palm Sunday are the, are same, the same, same same event. Keep as going. Jesus is walking up, it's recorded in, in Matthew chapter twenty one. As he is being brought in, it says most of the crowd spread their garments on the road ahead of him. Others cut branches from the trees and spread them onto the road. Jesus was in the center of the procession and the people all around him were shouting, praise God uh, for the son of David. Blessings on the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Praise God in the highest heaven. And the the entrance to the city of Jerusalem was in an uproar as he entered. Now, it's interesting. You have this one group of people going, blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord. And they're laying down palm branches. They're super excited about it. But then it goes on to say this. So when he entered the city, there's a group of people that says, who is this, they ask. And the crowd replied, it's Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth, the Galilee. <laughs> so in the same way as what we see today, Jesus comes in. One group seems to understand who he is. Yeah, sort and of And another group doesn't even know who he is. Yeah. Now, it's only a few days later that the same crowd that's hollering, blessed is he that comes in the name of the yeah, Lord, Hosanna. laying down palm branches. In a few days, there's this shout that says, give us Barabbas and crucify Jesus, which comes from the crowd. And I, and I think we've said this many times, and I think it's really important, is that you can't go with the crowd. No. Today we have this, this habit, and it's actually a bad habit. Because of pressure, peer pressure, whatever you want to call it, we tend to want to go with the crowd. What is sure. everybody thinking? What does the world think about sexuality? Then that's what I need to think about sex. What does the world think about politics? That's what sure. I need to think about. What does the world think about God? Then that's the crowd is fickle. Yeah. You know, the crowd says, you know, laying down palm branches, this is him. Yeah. Days later, give us Barabbas, crucify this guy. He's our king, kill him. That's the schizophrenia of this this particular crowd of the crowd in general, and so so we see him coming. There's a group that sort of re the group that sort of recognizes him, which later I think they they turn their back on that. Then there's a group that goes, "Who the heck is this again? Well, who is this? Yeah, who are you? You know?" And yeah. I, I don't know that it's any different today. No, I don't think so I either. Think we have the same same issue. I don't think so either. And and I did a little bit of research on this particular portion and and the palm branches were weird to me. I was like, why palm why palm fronds? That's what it says specifically. Why palm fronds and 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 those things? Why why is that what they picked? They could have picked anything, could have laid anything on the ground, and they they picked clothing and palm branches. And and there's only one connection that I could actually find, and it's the Festival of Shelters. And essentially the Festival of Shelters was the largest and biggest and happiest festival that God commissioned the people to have. Um, this is huge. It's the festival of the harvest. It's a festival of all these different things in scripture. And the reason that I bring this up is because one of the pieces of the festival of shelters is that they would wave palm branches in the air as they danced. So they're dancing with palm branches. And I think the reason that this is, this is worthy and valuable to this conversation is that, you know, Jesus is entering into Jerusalem and these people are at least somewhat recognizing him for who he is. And by waving these palm branches, they're essentially tying Jesus to the festival of shelters, which would be the, the happiest and most joyous time of year. It's like if they were waving Christmas wreaths around. It's like, that's the kind of symbolism that they have. They're like, hey, this is the happiest, most joyous time of year. Um, and this is, again, we're connecting that. This was not the time for the festival of shelters, but by waving these palm fronds, that's what they would, that's one of the traditions they had inside the festival of shelters. So this is where like- so They could be hey, waving their bows in the air, the greatest time of the year, you know, they're, bows, <laughs> they're compound bows. Oh, there's that. And broad, right, right. And broad deer heads season, and climbing deer stands. <laughs> so best time of the year. Go ahead. It's go ahead. the so best sorry. time of year, right? No, yeah. but, I, but I mean like, but I think what they're doing here, it, it's a, it's a great symbolism. And I think you could, there's more connections that could be made to the festival of shelters. Cause it's also the festival of tabernacles and all those things. We don't have time for that. But point being is this, is that I, they're connecting this moment to the most joyous time of year for them. So, so it's Sunday, Jesus is entered Jerusalem 
There's yep. this 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 real bunch of fanfare, pomp and circumstance. No, no pun. <laughs> and um, and and there's this this excitement that's going on. Um, he goes into the city. We don't have much information about what specifically he did after he went in on yep. this particular day. Not much. Um, but he spends the night. He, he leaves Jerusalem and he goes and spends the night in Bethany, which is a town just outside of there. Bethany is a very significant place for yep. Jesus. He has some, some very important people in his life that he loves. It's there. Mary and Martha. Their brother Lazarus, Lazarus whom Simon, he raised from the dead. Yeah, yep. right. Simon the leper, yep. but he's no longer a leper. leper yep. You want to know why? Because he met he's Jesus, healed. right? Yep. That's right. He's there. Um, there, you know, th- there's a whole wave of people um, that are there. You, you've got Mary Magdalene. Yep. There's, there's a, a group of people that Bethany, in my my summation, when I read through the scripture, and this is going to be one of those subplots as you're looking through scripture, I think Bethany represents that place where Jesus can go, and he's among people that that get him sure. and love him, um, and I think he has a place, it's a place to rest. So after this triumphant entry, it's been a great day, that's awesome, everything's yep. incredible, he goes to Bethany and he spends the night. Um, the next morning, which would be Monday, Monday yep. gets up, leaves Bethany. On his way to Jerusalem, um, he comes in contact with the fig tree. Let me give you guys some verses of scripture for you to, to so that you can follow along. Matthew chapter 21, verse 12, Mark 11, 22, Luke 19, 45. In those areas, you're going to have these these particular events. So if you want to go through this with your family, that gives you the verse to go from. So it's Luke 19, 45. Or Matthew 21, 12 is probably Matthew 21, 12. I was just trying to see if you know your Bible. Matthew 21, 12. <laughs> Um, and it's elsewhere in scripture, but this is the, the one that I looked at that I thought was pretty good. It says, in the morning, Jesus returned to Jerusalem. Um, uh, he was hungry and he noticed that a fig tree, um, let me see. Let's get it away from my eyes a little further. <laughs> and he know, dude, I can't see. I, my glasses are in the other room. And he noticed that a fig tree beside the road, he went over to see if there was any figs, but there were only leaves. And then he said to it, may you never bear fruit again. And immediately the fig tree withered up. Now, the reason why this is an important event, and it's all a picture, the fig tree is a picture, and it's used throughout Scripture, it is a picture of Israel, of Jerusalem. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's a fig, the fig tree is a picture of their fruitfulness as they carry out God's ministry and mission and work. And so when he gets here, there's this fig tree. It's got leaves. In other words, it looks really good, Yeah, but it has no fruit. There's no reason so, it shouldn't be producing fruit. That's right. And so Jesus says, may you never bear fruit again. One of the things we know prophetically is we know that 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 God's people, the Hebrew people, who are his chosen people, by the way, God wanted to use them to carry the message of the gospel to the entire world. Sure. Now, their Messiah, who they have looked for, who they've prayed for, who they've stationed and set themselves up for, even these feast days that they're observing right now, they look really holy because they're observing all these feast days. You talk right. about the the the, the, the well, shelters, shelters and, and the Passover yep. and and later we'll have Pentecost and all these other other festivals. All of these pointed to and were foreshadowings of Jesus. But what's about to happen is he's going to go into the city gates and they're not going to recognize him. Yeah. John's gospel said he came into his own and they recognized him not. So, yeah. so Jesus is actually going to go to the people who have literally waited centuries for him to enter and be who he is and deliver them as he is. They were looking for physical deliverance, but he was looking to deliver them spiritually, which has greater implications. Sure. And they don't even recognize who he is. And yeah. so that fig tree is a picture of them. We know, according to the prophecy of the 70 weeks found in the book of Daniel, is that God cuts Israel off at that moment. Yep. When he enters Jerusalem on that cult of a donkey and his own people plot his death. God cuts the nation of Israel off as far as, it doesn't mean he disowns them. Sure. doesn't mean he doesn't love them. doesn't mean they're not his, his children, but he cuts them off as far as their responsibility of carrying the gospel. Sure. And he takes that responsibility and he puts it in the hands of the ecclesia. The ecclesia is the church, a called out body of believers. And so he puts that in their hands and, and, um, and they now have the responsibility, but that fig tree is a symbol of that. God says, you know what? You're not going to bear fruit anymore until... One of these days, they unannounced, the church will be raptured out, and once again, Israel will have seven years during the time of the tribulation to carry the gospel to the ends of the earth, and they will do it, by the way. Absolutely. So so on that Monday, so we we Sunday was the triumphant entry, not much else recorded on that Sunday. He goes back to Bethany, resting, comes out of Bethany, back to Jerusalem that next morning, sees the fig tree. 
Yep. Fig tree's not bearing fruit. He curses it. And then he does something else. And this is in Let's see Luke 19, 41. Luke 19, 41. Jesus weeps over Jerusalem. Uh, it says, but as he came close to Jerusalem and saw the city ahead, he began to weep. How I wish today that you of all people would understand uh, the way to peace. But now it is too late and peace is hidden from your eyes. Before long, your enemies will build ramparts against your walls and encircle you and close in on you from every side. They will crush you into the ground and your children with you. Your enemies will not leave a single stone in place because you did not recognize it when God visited you. So like you said earlier, this is kind of the moment when Jesus understands what the future is going to hold for Jerusalem, that ultimately Jerusalem is going to suffer and they're going to suffer greatly, which we know is fulfilled in history. Um, just a few short years later after Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, uh, the Romans do eventually desecrate. Um, it's the, what's the, what's the term for it? It's the the abomination um, of desolation. Uh, abomination of desolation. Yeah, completely destroys um, Jerusalem, and uh, it's a it's a bad a bad beat. And Jesus, I think, is seeing and understanding that this was their moment to kind of maybe avoid that, and they missed it. You know, the second time this is the second time that Jesus weeps over Jerusalem. The first time he weeps over Jerusalem, he says that they're as sheep without a shepherd. That's right. And so you you see this vision of what Jesus wants for people. What does God want for people? Well, he wants people to have a shepherd right? and Jerusalem didn't have that. Now their shepherd has come yeah. and they reject him. And so he weeps again. Why? Because this is the consequences of rejecting your shepherd. That's right. They rejected the one that could save them. Therefore they're going to suffer this judgment that didn't have to be, you know? Um, and and it, this is such a picture of, everything we face even today. It's Absolutely like, I mean, it's, it is. it's just, it's just, again, scripture is so beautiful in the way that it plays out that it's like, you know, it, Jesus came and he offers his life as a sacrifice for men, as a ransom for many. That's right. And it's like, and those who call upon him will experience incredible things. And those who walk away will experience consequences. That's right. That. It's like, and that is completely your choice. You're not forced. You have an opportunity to choose. That's right. But if you choose to walk away from God, there, there are consequences that Jerusalem made its choice. And now Jesus, it pains him that they made that choice. That That's right. it, 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 he weeps that it's like, man, this this hurts me that you're choosing this way. I wish this didn't have to go like that's this, right. but it's gonna have to. That's that's yeah. I do love how Jesus doesn't this burdens and pains him, but he doesn't change the consequence because it pains him. He goes, right. it pains me because you're going to have to go through this, but I'm not going to relent. So this has to happen this way um, in order for you to experience what you need to experience. So that's kind of the first half. We're out of time. <laughs> so there. In. So continuing where we kind of left off, Jesus is weeping over Jerusalem. Um, and then that drives him to do something a little different. Uh, he enters Jerusalem coming from Bethany. Obviously, this is where he lays eyes on the city. And as he is outside the city laying eyes on it, um, it pains him. And then Jesus goes into the temple and something else ensues. Kind of walk me through that. So this is when he cleanses the temple. Um, and so I'm, I'm so so we're, we're on. So we've we've entered Jerusalem on Sunday. Yep. Triumphant entry. Monday, we've done a few different things. We've cursed a fig tree. Yep. We've wept over Jerusalem. And then we come to this point on Monday of the cleansing of the temple. Um, and Jesus comes in, doesn't like what's happening in the temple, yeah. and absolutely wreaks havoc. He's completely un Jesus like. <laughs> um, he does it with a stick. Well, it's kind of a secondary pain. You know, it's like I, I think outside the city, there was this pain of kind of Jerusalem's overall choice. And then when he gets inside the temple, there's this pain of just kind of a direct rebellion that like, you know, I think the overall rebellion kind of pushed him to tears, but the directs just the being, it just stuffed up his nose, this direct rebellion, essentially what's happening in the temples that they're, they're just disgracing it. It's just not, they're not necessarily destroying it. They're just, they're doing things. The temple was never designed for like they're, they're ripping people off when they're changing money and they're selling things and ripping people off and they're using this stuff. And there's just blatant sin going on in the middle of the temple. And they've turned it into, Jesus says, a house of thieves. And it's like, man, that, that rebellion, I think just pushes Jesus over the edge. Well, and you have to remember that the temple that we're talking about is again, a foreshadowing as the sacrifices were a foreshadowing of Jesus. The temple is a foreshadowing of God's ultimate temple that he wants to dwell mm. in, which is us. Right. We are the temple of the Holy Spirit today. Right. And so if you look at how Jesus, what he wants that, that temple to be, it needs to be a place of prayer, not a place where it's misused, not sure. a place where it's abused. 
in the same way, this temple yeah, us. Is, yeah. the, is exactly the same way. So he cleanses the temple, um, and then later he leaves and spends the night that night in Bethany, leaves Bethany and comes back on Tuesday. So that brings us to Tuesday. So we're on, we're on the third day of this of this Holy, Holy Week. Week. Sure. And so um, as they're walking in, it's interesting, the fig tree thing. Bring they the fig tree it, back. And yep. Peter Peter goes, hey, there's a fig tree, and it's kind of withered. Yeah. And, and then Jesus teaches them about faith and how that, you know, the face of a grain of mustard seed, you know, and he tells them about those things. Because um, literally the day before, this was a healthy fig tree. That's right. I mean, right. except for fruit production, that's which right. again makes it, is it really a healthy fig tree? Because it's not producing fruit. Yeah. But Jesus came in and, and curses it on Monday. And then on Tuesday, as they're walking in, it's dead. That's, that's right. only one day later. It's like, man, that's incredible. And he, they enter the city. He gets within proximity of the temple, and Jesus begins to pronounce these woes on his enemies. He begins to tell us about what you know, what's going to happen to the enemies. Um, that's pretty much all we have on about Tuesday. They leave. I mean, as far as in Jerusalem, they yeah, leave, yeah. and they and Jesus does what's known as the Olivet Discourse, which is um, a very interesting. Uh, it's an interesting message, and it's found in in multiple places, but. It's found in Matthew chapter 24, verses 1 through Matthew chapter 25, verse 46. And so you have this Olivet Discourse, which is just a message that Jesus teaches and preaches on, which is really an incredibly beautiful message. And I, I tend to believe that the things that Jesus had to say closer to the end of his physical life are like really condensed and saturated, um, powerfully put together yeah. um, kind of things. Well, he would know... He would know the timeline, and so, oh yeah, I, I, and he is he is fully God, but he's also fully man. And I, and I think you would be naive to say, and I don't know. I mean, see what you think, but the, I think you would be naive to say that Jesus didn't feel that pressure with how much time was left, and that that may have drifted into what he taught and when he taught, um, because he knew that you know the day is coming, and it's very very soon. It's not years away anymore. It's days away before this will all change. And that may have bled into some of the seriousness of the teachings that he taught. Well, and if you look at these teachings, they, they really focus on preparedness. Right. You know, of all the topics that Jesus loved to speak on, he spoke on being prepared probably more than anything else. Right. And so that's the Olivet Discourse is really a, a, a series of messages really powerful messages about being prepared. Jesus is about to leave. When I was a kid, my mom worked, she was a nurse. And uh, when she would leave the house, she'd always leave us with this list of things that she wanted us to do and right. things that she didn't want us to do. Right. And she'd get us up out of bed and she'd go, hey, during the summertime, you know, we're at home, me and my brother, bunch of knuckleheads. <laughs> and she'd go, hey, here's what you're going to get done today. This is what you're right. going to clean. This is what you're going to, you know, you're going to mop this floor. You're going to do this. You're going to do your chores. You're going to do this, this, this. Here's what you're not going to do. Right. You are not going to do this, this, and this. Do you understand me? I'm about to leave. <laughs> and when I leave, when I come back, this is what I want things to look like. And this right. is what I want things not to look like. You right. understand? Right. You know, and I the, the Olivet Discourse is very similar. Jesus is about to leave, and he is absolutely laying down some very saturated, pointed teachings. It's worth going through. It's worth it's worth studying, and and I would encourage everybody to study that. But that happens on, on Tuesday. Right. Right. Um, that night, Tuesday night, that evening, Judas also at the same time is negotiating um, with the Pharisees to betray Jesus. And yeah. So he's already in this process of, of you know, talking to the Sanhedrin. Um, he's trying to to come. They're kind of trying to come to grips with, you know, what does that look like? And I find, I think that's around verse twenty six, chapter twenty six. I think the questions that they're asking to is, how could they pull oh, it Matthew. off? How, what would it cost? You know, to, for them, what would they have to pay Judas for him to do it? And then also, what would, you know, how would they pull it off? Because, again, you're talking about a guy that just had the triumphant intro on Monday. Oh, yeah. And you're talking thousands of people out on the road, laying down their garments, laying down, you know, branches. If they were to arrest him in the middle of that, they could incite a riot, and that would be a pain for them. They're trying, the, the Sanhedrin at this point, they've already been plotting against Jesus. They already want to mm -hmm. kill him. That's They've already made that known. But now they're trying to find a way to do it without inciting a riot. And so like, okay, how can we arrest Jesus? And get, if we can arrest him peacefully, then we know we can get him on trial and get him killed. That part's not that hard. But getting him brought into custody while he's out front during the day, whatever else is going to be complicated. And so they start conspiring with Judas to find a time, because they didn't have like surveillance back then. They're yep. trying to find a time when they could arrest Jesus where he's out in the open and they could arrest him without a bunch of people knowing about it is essentially what they're doing. Yeah. 
So, so Jesus leaves Jerusalem, goes back to Bethany, spends the night in Bethany, gets up Wednesday morning, and as far as the, the Gospels are concerned, there's not a ton of information about Wednesday at all. In fact, we have very little information whatsoever. Yep. It looks like they canceled midweek services. <laughs> that was um, it, yeah. I'm not sure. Yep. But they weren't having small groups on Wednesday. Yep. Um, any anyway, our student ministry. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, so anyway, Jesus, for what we can see, pretty much remains in, in Bethany during that time. So Thursday... Um, Thursday morning or Thursday, Peter and John, they're sent to prepare for the Passover meal. Yep. They're sent to get that, secure the upper room and get everything ready, get everything prepared. And they do. Which is the second, which real quick, which is the second really interesting piece about that particular thing. This is the second time in this week that I really feel like Jesus shows his lordship, his, his kinship to God. Um, by being able to, I think sometimes we we present this story, not we specifically, but more so the, the Christian, Christianity presents this story as Jesus was kind of just going into Jerusalem and these bad <coughs> things sort of befall him. That it's like, oh my gosh, these exterior forces were at work and they kind of forced something upon Jesus. What you have to understand is that when Jesus sent the disciples to look for the cult, he told them where it would be. He told them what it would look like. He told them what would happen. And it happened exactly as he said it. The same thing is true with the upper room. When he says, go look for this upper room, it's already going to be prepared. This is the person you're looking for. This is what they look like. This is what they're carrying. This is what you say to them. And this is what's going to happen. And as he said it is how it happens. And so I think for Jesus, you have to look at this and go, hey, he is in full control on Holy Week. Jesus is not befallen by anybody. The Judas and the Sanhedrin are making plans. They're conspiring behind his back, but he is not surprised. Jesus knows exactly what's going to happen. He knows when it's going to happen. He knows how it's going to happen, and he's not confused or surprised at all by what, what takes place in this. I think another facet to that is this, is that you see that there are people that have a relationship with Jesus that we don't see mentioned in Scripture. We don't really even know who they are. We don't know their name or anything else. But they have a relationship with Jesus. They have a disciplined relationship with Jesus, an obedient relationship with Jesus, and they do exactly what it, the cult of the donkey. Yeah. They said, all you got to do is tell them the master requires it, and th the dude was ready to go. Let you take it. Yep. Now, among that wave of people, they're going, blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord. You know, that's people always looking for something sensational. You yeah. know, I need an emotional experience at church. Yeah. If, we ain't got, <laughs> if we ain't got a miracle this week, I'm not going. Sure. Um, so you've got that. And then on the flip side of that, you got people going, who is that again? Wait, yeah. is that, wait who are what? You? What is that? Yeah. Uh, you know, um, but then you have these people in the background, nameless, faceless, disciplined. They're ready to do what God asked them to do. It reminds me of Elijah. If you'll remember when Elijah's under the juniper tree and yeah. he's belly aching, he's like, I'm the only one that's been faithful to oh, you. It's just me. Just kill me now. And God's like, no, yeah. I got hundreds of people out there that have yeah. not bent their knee to Baal. Mm -hmm. And so I think in the same way, that's what we're seeing here. There are relationships that Jesus has with people that may not be in the forefront as far as us recognizing their name, but they are faithful, they're following, they're doing what he asks, and they're there. And we could be one of those people. Sure. Um, and I can guarantee you, you'll know who owns the donkey and who had the upper room when we get to heaven. When we get to heaven one day. You know, yeah. um, you'll, you'll know who they are. We don't know who they are right now, but but we, we will, will know. know. We know they we know what they did though. Sure. You yeah. know, there was no, hey, let's let's how much you want to give me for that? It yeah. wasn't like the that widow with the two mites is the same way. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, same yeah. kind of story. What's her so, name? Yeah, exactly. You don't know. But she but, <laughs> but we you know, know what she did. I, her did. Yeah. Her That's actions, right. yeah. She gave more than anybody. So so in this story, so you've got this is Thursday. They are going into the town. Peter and John are sent to find this upper room that's already ready, and they are to make preparations there for the Lord's Supper to be observed, uh, or Passover meal to be observed yep. in, in this thing. So keep going from there. Which is observed in their day as part of their tradition at sunset. Because right. that's when the Passover feast. Remember, you would you would slay the lamb at sunset. You would eat it in haste with your sandals on and sandals you, on, get yep. ready to go. Standing up, yep. you know, that's because we're fixing to get out of here, right? Um, it, because it was the children of Israel being led right. out of Egypt. This is and, the meal they would eat right before the end of Exodus. That's right. when they're leaving Egypt. Keep that's going. That's exactly yep. right. And so we have the Lord's Supper as it's instituted. Mm -hmm. um, at that meal as well, um, th this is where you're going to see where Judas is revealed as being the disciple that's going to betray Jesus. Because um, doesn't he, he dips? Yeah. Um, so essentially there's this moment at the Lord's Supper when Jesus is sitting there with all the disciples. There's a little bit of discord conversation that goes on about betrayal. Jesus says something really cryptic. And when he does, everybody's like, what? And who's, so he says, yeah, who's the one going to betray you? Who's going to betray you? And, and because like someone's going to betray me he sits at this table and everybody's like, what? No, we're not going to no. And Jesus is like, whoever dips after me with the, you know, it's like chips and salsa or something. It's like whoever dips after me gets, you know, is going to be the one who betrays me. And sure enough, Judas dips 
his stuff directly after Jesus? So this goes in line with with some of the things we've had conversations about with when you look at different belief systems. Okay. So Calvinists believe that God predetermines and pre-chooses mm-hmm. who, who, whoever he will. Yep. Um, others believe that people have the ability to choose. In this instance, this is such a microcosm of that picture. Jesus knew who would betray him. Sure. But Judas chose. Yeah, he makes a choice. To betray him. Yeah. He makes a decision. Yeah. Jesus makes him live with it. Yeah. You know, and so after that, you know, Jesus tells him, he said, whatever you're going to do, do it quickly. And Judas at that point, it's interesting to, to take note is because sometimes we'll say the devil made me do it or whatever. Yeah. So when Jesus says, whatever you're going to do, the betrayal you're going to do, then go do it quickly. The Bible says that Judas left this meal into the darkness. And the Bible says that at that moment, the devil entered, entered him. him. It's interesting. It wasn't until then. It wasn't until then. So Judas is not possessed and forced to make the wrong. God protected him to make a choice. Judas made that choice. He made that decision. He chose to betray Jesus, and he walks out. And after making that choice, the devil, the Bible says, entered him, and Judas goes, and he sells Jesus out for 30 pieces of silver. Which we made a huge episode about this. I'll link it right here uh, about the uh, the Diablos, or the possession yeah, by the right. devil specifically. When was Judas possessed? Why was he able to be possessed? Yeah. What does that look like? We've, we've answered all those questions before. I will link that video here. Yeah. You can watch it uh, and see that. But but I do think it is important to understand Judas makes his decision. I do think God forced him to live with it, kind of like what with Pharaoh, where Pharaoh makes a decision and God makes him stick with that decision That's right. through all the heartache of the plagues. Although, does that mean his choice was cheapened? No, it just means that God made him stick with a choice that he made. Yeah. Um, and so that way his glory could be fully you know revealed. So with this, Judas walks out of dinner with Jesus. Um, into the night, possessed by the devil at that point, goes to the Sanhedrin, uh, we would assume, to conspire and get ready to arrest Jesus because Judas knows what's coming next, yep. which is that Jesus takes three disciples, the, the, the three closest disciples, and goes out into the Garden of Gethsemane. Correct? That's right. So in the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus goes to pray. Um, and this is where we see kind of the, the, the Jesus under pressure. Um, in the Garden of Gethsemane. Uh, He goes to the Garden of Gethsemane and goes to pray with his three disciples. He sets them in one place. He goes a little bit further and prays by himself. While he's there, he sweats blood, literally prays so hard that he busts blood vessels in his forehead and sweats blood. Uh, He's so, you know, obviously constrained by the thought of what's about to take place. Uh, And then he comes back to his disciples and his disciples are asleep. They're asleep on the ground. He's like, hey, I told you to pray. Can you not pray for like five minutes with me without falling asleep? They couldn't. They fall asleep. He comes back again. They fell asleep again. It's like two or three times that they keep falling asleep. That's right. And uh, and Jesus finally is like, okay, that's it. And about that time, they hear drum beats. Um, and what's happening is that the the Sanhedrin have mustered their soldiers and they're coming to the Garden of Gethsemane in the middle of the night to arrest Jesus, which is an interesting piece of the story um, because like we talked about earlier, you know, when Jesus is arrested, a few interesting thing, things take place in this story, which where is this at? So we're uh, at the arresting of Jesus. Yeah, it's at the end is, of th- Thursday. It's at the end of Thursday. Um which I'm trying to see. Let's see here. It's in Matthew chapter 26, verse 36, uh, verse 47, sorry. Um, verse 47 is where this part of the story picks up. Um, they go to arrest Jesus. Peter pulls out a fillet knife and cuts the ear off of the servant of one of the people that are there. Uh, and and Jesus makes him sheath his sword. And he says, hey, those who live by the sword will die by the sword. You know, stop that business, essentially. Picks up the ear off the ground puts the ear back on the on the servant and, and heals him, uh, which is interesting. And then as the soldiers ask, you know, who are you? Uh, Jesus says, I am. And when he says, I am, it knocks all the soldiers to the ground. It's like this right. incredible display of God's power. Uh, ends up, Judas betrays him with a kiss, which confirms several Old Testament prophecies of him being betrayed by a kiss. Uh, so Judas comes up, kisses Jesus on the cheek, and sure enough, at that moment, Jesus is arrested. His disciples are... Um, scattered uh they run one of them even is stripped they rip his cloak off of him they go to runs. grab him yeah and he just comes out of his coat yeah they come they go to grab me comes out of his coat and runs off that's naked a plot twist naked into the night yeah. um and so jesus is arrested and this is a pretty this is a pretty big moment in in kind of because at this point and i think this is why jesus is under so much pressure obviously 
he's known how this story is going to end from the beginning. Obviously, it, proximity to the ending, I think, puts him under pressure. But I think even more than that, Jesus is under pressure because he knows at this point, once he's arrested, there's no going back. It's yeah. like, well, this is this is the last moment that things could go differently. Once you're arrested, it's over. You're going to the cross, which I, Jesus knew he was going to the cross. But being fully man, I do think that Jesus had, obviously in his prayer, he says, if this cup can pass from me, please let it pass from me. But if your will, if it's your will, then your will be done. Obviously, Jesus was completely submitted to God's will. Sure. I've heard people make the argument that he wasn't. I, that's baloney. Jesus is completely and totally submitted to God's will. At the same time, it's also going to hurt. And I think there's this moment where Jesus is like, oh man, if there's any other way, <laughs> please, dear Lord, do not make me go through this. But at the same time, just like, if it's your will, hey, I'll suffer. I will I will do so in your name and it's no, no thing. So Jesus is arrested and he goes to trial essentially next. So yeah, kind of sequence, walk me through. Sequence, yeah. sequence of trials. Yeah. So, so there's several trials in a row that, that take place next. Kind of walk me through those. Well, what's, con what's incredible is if you stop and think for a second, it was just Sunday. Yeah. Jesus is being celebrated. Mm -hmm. And and now it's Thursday. Yeah. He's arrested. Yep. Um, you know, Peter, you know, tries his, you know, it says sword, but we know Peter was a fisherman. If you look at that word sword means it actually literally in the original text means dagger. Dagger. Yeah. But you wouldn't have carried a dagger. Yeah. This is not Dungeons and Dragons. <laughs> he's a he's a fisherman. Fisherman. So yeah. chances are it was a flay knife, like you said. Yeah, he cuts the like guy's that, yeah. cuts Malchus's ear off and Jesus heals it. They find out the next day, he put it on upside down just to mess with him. So, no, it's not true. It's not true. I'm, making that, that, legit, I'm making that up. They're like, see, psych your mind. So, mess with me. His ears um, on backwards. Yeah, his, his earring was hanging down. Um, they put it down a little low, you know, like Malchus. It was dark. <laughs> what can you say? <laughs> Look like that thing off the Goonies. So, <laughs> keep going. So, so Jesus is arrested, and and so this is a cohort of Roman soldiers, which would be six to nine hundred soldiers that come to arrest Jesus. You and I, when we were at the Garden of Gethsemane, one of the things that I thought was really incredible because it's on the Mount of Olives, which yeah. is just outside the city gates. Jesus would have in in the dark. You got to think there's no street lights. Yeah. Um, in the, the dark, nighttime. their um, torches is what they would have used for light. Yep. I mean, they don't even have a headlamp. Yeah, um, they're 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 praying. When the soldiers come out, they would have been very noisy, clanking yeah, and banging. It says they're playing drums. Yeah. So. so they're just, they're coming out. We've got this noisy deal. Jesus, all he had to do was to go over the Mount of Olives yep. to the other side, and he would have escaped this arrest. And it chances are it might have diffused it. Um, had he stayed away from Jerusalem for a while, it could all that could have gone, gone away. away. Sure. But he doesn't. No. He stays, and he waits for those soldiers to make their way all the way up to the Mount of Olives, which is a it's not a long way. I mean, you can see the city gates from the Mount of Olives. It's, yeah. it's, it's just one valley apart. And when I say valley, don't think of like mountain like Everest. I mean, it's yeah, like no. a hill. Yeah. Um, I would say probably, I'd say probably that whole, the whole journey from the city gates to the, to mostly the top of the Mount of Olives, which most likely Jesus somewhere in there. Um, I wouldn't even say it's a half mile. No, I mean I'd say it's no. it's less than that. So oh, I mean yeah. you're you're dealing with you're dealing maybe a quarter mile, maybe a little more um, from from where they were. Yeah. Uh, so Jesus is not super far away. He would have seen with the naked eye. You'd absolutely be able to see the city gates when they come out the city gates coming towards Jesus. He would have immediately seen and known who they were. Yep. And so his first trial is before Ananias. Yep. Um, and. Ananias, so so Jesus has to be found guilty by the religious people. Right. And then the religious people are going to turn him over to the Romans. Here's the issue. The Romans don't want to have anything to do with a religious issue. They, sure. they need something that has to do with an insurrection. Sure. Or they want something where someone's creating a problem. Sure. It, it, it's got to be That's going to lead to an insurrection. Yeah, it's <laughs> yeah. it's got to be a problem on a, like, a... Uh, Polit political level yeah. or, or or maybe a physical level before they're going to get involved. They're well, not it, trying to. They're not. They're not going to settle religious disputes. So there's things sure. have to happen for this. You know, this thing has to elevate. So sure. Well, they absolutely wouldn't. I mean, they don't. They don't join in the the uh, the religion. So there's like, they're like, why do I care if your God is defamed? Because I don't. I don't care. I mean, yeah. it's not my God. And so Ananias going, yeah. is the high priest. Yep. And so what's happening is he's there. He's waiting for somebody to bring an accusation. He can't. He has no grounds to accuse Jesus either. Now it's important to remember that all of this is happening at nighttime. Right. Trials were never allowed to happen at nighttime. So every single one of these hearings is illegal. Yeah. Whether it's the religious hearing or the actual judiciary hearing of of the powers that be during that time. So, um, 
So then um, there's, there is an accusation levied. We come to the second trial, um, which is before the Sanhedrin. The Sanhedrin condemned Jesus. Um, then there's a third trial. It's at dawn. Um, and while this is happening, all of these trials are happening in proximity. There's this fire kind of being kept in the middle of this area. There's kind of a courtyard area. And these trials are all taking place in the same area. In that same area, um, at this particular point, at the third trial, this is when Peter denies Jesus for the yeah. third time. So uh, a little, you know, someone asked Peter, are you not one of his disciples? No, no, no. A little girl asked him, no, yeah. no. I'll tell you for truth, for sure, I'm not one of his disciples. Exactly what Jesus had actually said and prophesied during the Lord's Supper, by the way. Um, Peter said, I'm not ever going to deny you. Yeah. Um, I'd never, I'd die first. And Jesus said, no, no, before the cock crows, you, you know, you're going to deny me three times. And so that you even know me. That's yeah. yeah. And so, and he did. Um, he did exactly what he said. And and I think one of the things we have to keep in mind is, is that at the, by this point, Jesus has been beaten really, really horribly bad. Yeah. So so we're, we're not flogged yet, yeah. but he's been beaten people. Yeah. I mean, and so where every circumstance the disciples had seen Jesus in, he always had this certain power. I mean, if it was a, if the waves are roaring, we're about to sink. Jesus is like, hey, hang on. We got this. Be still. Um, someone's dead. He calls him to life. Um, you know, at every circumstance, Jesus has demonstrated his power. But in this moment, he submits to what's happening to him. And he does not demonstrate that he's going to stop it. Yeah. This is a startling moment for everybody there because they're going, wait a second. Up until now, everything has been exactly what we thought it would be. But now Jesus isn't acting how I thought he would act. Yeah. And so he's submitting to this and everybody's confused. Yeah. And everybody, including Judas. Yeah. Even Judas. Judas fully expected... I think Judas actually believed that Jesus was was very powerful. I don't think he believed in who he actually was, sure. but that he was very, very powerful, sent by God. And when Judas realizes, which, by the way, it's during the sixth trial that Judas actually kills himself, I think it's at that moment that Judas realizes that Jesus is not going to exert his power to overcome all this. Instead, he's going to submit to it, and he's going to die, and that's not the ending that Judas wanted. Yeah. That's not the Messiah that Judas was looking for. Well, one of the things that you could probably assume about Judas is that he was much like most of the people on the triumphant entry who believed that Jesus was probably this warring king yep. who was going to reestablish the 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 honor and the dignity of Israel yep. and all those things. And Judas may have thought in his mind that this is a way to force his hand to where now you're going to have to do it. What, what, yep. we, what we have heard prophesied and everything else, you're going to have to fulfill that by doing this. And and again, that's a misrepresentation of who Jesus was and what Jesus came to do. And so therefore, that means Jesus doesn't believe in who Jesus really is. He believes in the idea of who Jesus is that he has in his mind, but that's not really who Jesus is. So so he kind of so kind of to, to comb through this, so there's 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 a bunch of trials that take place. Jesus is arrested. The first trial takes place that night against Ananias. Um and then you've got the secondary trial, which is the primary. This is the Sanhedrin, um, which is all of the religious leaders uh, and and all those things. They come together. They condemn Jesus. They say, hey, we find grounds that he should be uh, killed for this. Uh, then you have third trial, the third one, which happens at dawn. Um, and, and so that's the next one. This is uh, when the condemnation is kind of confirmed. Mm -hmm. So now the, he got a... Um, a condemnation, if you will, a um, a sentencing. And then now this is the confirmation of that sentencing that everyone is in agreement. It's time to kill Jesus. Uh, the fourth trial that takes place is a trial before Pilate. Mm -hmm. So that next morning he goes before Pilate. Now who's Pilate? Pilate is the Roman governor of the region. Mm -hmm. The Romans had a way of governing people that was actually really smart. They allowed the people to somewhat govern themselves, but they took away certain high level responsibilities, meaning the government that they had, the religious government of the Jewish people had a lot of freedom to actually punish people to take care of their own affairs and whatever else. This gave the people a sense of power um, that they had, and it made people less likely to buck against the Roman Empire because they're saying, hey, the Romans are going to kind of let us do our thing. As long as nothing gets too out of hand, we're pretty much sure, good. Sure. And so the Romans were kind of letting them handle things, but there was one particular responsibility the people did not have, and that was capital punishment. That's right. The people could not kill people. They could put them in prison. They could flog them. They could do all those things. But ultimately, they would have to turn that responsibility over to the Romans. The Romans did not want them killing people in any re for any reason. So that they felt like that was too much power. So Pontius Pilate is the Roman governor who's been set up over this region. And essentially, the religious leaders have to go to Pilate in order to be able to get permission to get Jesus killed, to get yeah. capital punishment. So they put Jesus on trial before Pilate. There's only one problem. 
Pilate doesn't believe Jesus had done anything wrong. Nothing yeah. worthy, like you said earlier, nothing worthy of Roman interference. Pilate goes, wait a minute, if I kill this guy, number one, I would imagine that Pilate probably heard about the triumphant entry. It happened in his region. The Romans wouldn't have understood the triumphant entry. They wouldn't have understood the coming Messiah and all those things because they're not Jewish. And so like, we don't understand these things, but this would have been a big ruckus that has been created by this Jesus character. And so I'm sure he would have heard of these things. And in that, Pilate's going, how can I avoid a possible riot? How can we stay away from that? This region is already destabilized. Let's not make it any worse. In fact, we have a lot of historical backing that Pilate was really worried about a riot. In that, he kind of goes, hey, man, I don't, I don't really want anything to do with this. Well, I don't feel he, like this is us. Well, he asked Jesus, he says, so are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus said, you've said it. Mm -hmm. And immediately after that, Pilate goes, I don't have anything. I don't, I don't, I don't have anything against him. Well, I got, I got nothing. So, and then they go, but he's the one that's creating all this, these riots and he's creating right. this turmoil. That's and that's right. where things began to get kind of gimpy. Um, so then he asked, he says, um, so he's a Galilean. Yeah. And they said, yeah. He said, okay, well that's Herod's problem. Yeah, Herod. Send him yeah. Herod. The other, the other king that was uh, hmm. uh, in the region over the over the Galileans. He, so essentially, Pilate is trying to get out of this as best he can. So this is trial number four in front of Pilate. Then Pilate sends him to Herod, which is trial number five. Herod was actually excited to meet Jesus. Yes, yeah, right. He really wanted. He had been wanting for a while to meet Jesus. He's like, I want to meet him. I want to meet this Jesus guy. They send Jesus before Herod, and Jesus does not look for an ally. Jesus. Yep remain silent That's the right. whole time Herod's like do a miracle do something I want to see it I want to blah 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 and Jesus is like he answered him nothing there's no he doesn't answer any questions he doesn't perform any miracles he doesn't do nothing this infuriates Herod to a degree and so Herod has him flogged they beat him pretty good they stamp a crown of thorns over his head and they uh, wrap him in a purple robe to accentuate him as a king and they send him back send to Pilate him. That's right. Yeah. so Pilate. Herod's like I've, I've had my fill that's all I want um and then here's the sixth and final trial that yep. Jesus... So essentially at this point, this is where Jesus is taken for uh, Pilate at the judgment seat. And essentially Pilate is going to now uh, in, have a real trial. At this point, up until this point, everything's kind of been an inquiry uh, for Pilate. And then at the sixth trial, this is where Pilate gets serious. The gloves come That's off. Right. It's time for us to figure out a solution to this problem. This is also where you see Pilate try his final political move to try to get Jesus out of this predicament that he's in with um, Barabbas, where Pilate comes in and he goes, "Hey, I've got you know, I've got the power to release one prisoner to you." Uh, it happens every year, and he does. Keep he does going. actually two things. The first thing that that Pilate does that's when he's actually flogged. He's flogged under Pilate, so Pilate has him flogged, which means that he's beaten beyond recognition, probably. Right. So under Pilate, Pilate's working to release Jesus, and so the first thing Pilate does is he has Jesus flogged. Yeah. That beating would have been so horrific that's severe that that you would have not recognized him flesh would be missing off of his back his side off of his face yep. he would have been a, just a monster of a bloodbath of a human being at that point pilot most of the time when someone was flogged they were going to die anyway right so so people normally would release whatever they had against somebody after they kind of get over so, it. something like that was done to them nobody cares so he brings them to him and they're like no we want him dead so then Pilate does what he believes is unimaginable. He puts Jesus next to Barabbas, who is an absolute villain of the community. This yeah. guy is hated upon hated upon hated. By everyone. Yeah. He is the he is the absolute worst of the worst. And Pilate puts the two next to each other because for whatever reason, Pilate just does not want to make this choice to kill Jesus, which for good reason. Um, and he says, okay, you can either we'll either we'll either crucify Barabbas and set Jesus free, or will crucify Jesus and set Barabbas free. Now, this guy that's public enemy number one, in Pilate's mind, he thought this is a slam dunk. Yeah, easy. no, but nobody's going to want Barabbas, you know, if you will, the, the Jeffrey Dahmer of their community yeah. released. Lo and behold, the crowd, the same ones as blessed are he that comes in the name of the Lord. Now they're going, give us Barabbas, crucify Jesus. And that's where the beginning which, of the end begins. Which is where you've got, You've got Pilate who is pulling, this is a political move, 
And Pilot's actually pretty dang smart. It's a dang smart move. I mean, it almost worked. I mean, it's really smart. Essentially, what he's doing is he's leveraging their own tradition against them, which is that this time of year at Passover, they released a prisoner every single year. It was under the people's, uh, it was under the governor's ability. He could choose who it would be, um, but he, he relinquishes that to the people. He's hoping that they will choose Barabbas because he didn't want to make that choice either. He's like, hey, I'd rather you just choose Barabbas and then, or choose Jesus and then let me kill Barabbas because that's going to make everything easier. And you got to think, Barabbas has to be the worst prisoner they have on hand because this is the guy that Pilate's like, I've got to put somebody up against Jesus that no one would choose. And right. it, it, so it's Barabbas. So Barabbas gets put up there and sure enough, they choose Bar to release Barabbas and they want to kill Jesus, which That's is right. just, it, it just shows you how crazy this moment really is. And at that point, Pilate walks over and he washes his hands of this moment, which it doesn't really wash him of responsibility, but essentially he's saying that he's relinquishing this decision to the people and not to himself. But the proclamation, though, that he makes, though, is very prophetic. He says, may this blood, may the blood of his, him be on your heads. Yeah. And this is the very reason. And they claim that. And that's right. And this is the very reason why even today that you will find um, Orthodox Jews absolutely loathing the idea of Jesus being the Messiah. They think he's a Western construct. They and have so, to. And so why? Because they were the ones who ultimately would have crucified him. But in reality, we all crucified him. That's right. It was our sin. So so Jesus is handed over to be crucified. Yep. Um, the Roman soldiers at this point mock him. Yep. They act like they're bowing down to him. They put a crown of thorn upon, thorns upon his head. It's at this moment that Judas hangs himself. Yeah. Um, and he realizes at this point, nothing's going to change. Yeah. And so Jesus bears his cross. He carries it as far as he can. Blood loss, fluid loss, dehydration. He can't do it. Yeah. Someone's pulled from the crowd. Um, and they carry the cross out. Um, and Jesus is crucified around 9 a.m. Friday morning. Friday morning. Yep. And we're going to stop there. Yeah. Stop around and there. And so what we're going to do is, is next week we're going to look at what the, the crucifixion, yep. what Jesus had to say. Um, he said seven things, by the way, from the cross, seven things, number perfection and completion, yep. seven things from the cross. We'll look at that. We'll look at his burial. We'll look at how everybody accept and receive that. We'll look at his resurrection. Yep. And then we'll look at, you know, what those things look like. Yep. So guys, that's the podcast episode for this week. If you have questions, thoughts, concerns, put them in the comment section. We love answering those questions as best we can. Um, and in that, this is going to be a fantastic deal. So as always, please subscribe, share this video out, whether it be on Facebook or, or YouTube or even on uh, Spotify. Share this stuff out so that more people can hear it. We love getting the chance to contact people all around the world with the gospel of Jesus. So thank you guys so much, and we will see you guys on Sunday.